I hate my boss. Do any of you hate your boss? Hey? Come on, be honest. Hey? What is it that you don't like about your boss? Especially if you're your own boss. What's it that you don't like about your boss? Okay, bossy. What else? Unfair. Recruit and fire. There is a good one. Anybody else? He has the he has the kind of office. Okay, try that again. Are you ambush? Now, if you hate yourself, you got a problem. We're gonna to have to hang on to that. How many of you have had a boss that you liked? Good. So what did this boss do that made you like them? All right. Friendly, kind. Humble. Yeah. Yeah, well, all, all of us have our time. was respectful. He had empathy. Okay. A very good all right, so these are good attributes. Communication, empathy, kind, humble. Give credit where credit is due. So we sit with a situation that these people that have done all these studies, and some of the recent studies show some startling facts for you that can't see. 80% of leaders fail in the first two years. They don't make it. 75% of leaders today actually don't like their jobs. Mm -hmm. They don't like being a leader. 70% of them are stressed out all the time. 60% of employees resign and leave their job. Not because the pay is too little. Not because the working hours are too long. Or because the working conditions are not nice. They don't like their boss. Yeah. So how do we change this? I mean, what is the problem? For years, we've had managers. You read my books, you'll find that there's a big difference between a manager and a leader. Absolutely. I talk about leaders. We need to do something about it. And what is the Then the problem is still with the leader because the leader needs to recognize that. So we'll get back to the leader. Brand spoke about creativity, said creativity is not art. But I want to talk about the art of leadership. Hey, why is this thing paging quicker than it's supposed to? Leadership is an art. The art requires three things. The letters depict a particular skill or attribute that a leader needs to be able to be kind, humble, friendly, fair. And the leader needs an ability. I already spoke to you about changing your focus. Brunt spoke about being creative, about being different, how to do things differently. So why do you need to be a leader that keeps kicking butt all the time and hiring and firing why can't you be different? So, you need to learn how to lead. If we don't know how to lead, how do we lead? And we've spoken earlier about the school system. It was actually quite strange that she mentioned that the school works opposite to what Blue, uh, uh, Brunt had up there. But for those of you who recognize that that was Bloom's cognitive, part of Bloom's taxonomy of learning, that's the cognitive learning domain. And Benjamin Bloom was a principal who was also an educational psychologist. And it's quite weird that he developed that, but in schools it doesn't work the way that it was actually developed. The problem is, we get taught all kinds of things. We never get taught how to, how to lead. So we need to learn how to lead. So, talking about art, let's stick with the art. <coughs> I've always wanted to draw, and I consider myself a bit of an artist. I think I draw quite well. So what happens is I have in my mind this picture 
of this magnificent black stallion galloping graciously through the green meadow. And then I get so passionate about this that I decide I'm going to capture this stallion on paper. So I start drawing. I mean, this beautiful stallion with its flowing black mane and this muscular body of it with those muscles rippling as it runs and the tail flowing in the wind. And there I have my stallion. <laughs> Sorry, it looks more like a rat. The point is, I never went to art school. There are some people that are naturally gifted, that can do it. One of the people that I know is a guy called S.P. van der Merwe. He puts a lot of his drawings and stuff on Instagram. But speaking to S.P., he still says that he, although it's a natural talent, he still had to learn certain basics. He still has to practice that skill every day to get better. So even though you might have a natural talent, you don't automatically have it. Let's look at a famous painter. Yo, he's dark. That's supposed to be Leonardo da Vinci. We all know Leonardo da Vinci. The famous paintings that he painted. But Leonardo da Vinci was born in Florence. He was born out of wedlock. And his mother was a peasant worker. And because of that, they couldn't afford to put him in a formal school. So he was mostly homeschooled by his mother. But because his mother worked in other people's households, she couldn't spend a lot of time with him. So he ran around the streets a lot. And eventually, he managed to find his way into the studio of one of the then most famous painters, Andrea Di Cioni. And he eventually ended an apprenticeship. And it took years of practice, of learning shape and form and color and all of these things. And eventually, he got to a point where Di Cioni allowed him to paint with him. Not even on his own, with him. And years after that, he eventually was allowed to paint on his own. And we know the paintings. Mona Lisa being one of the famous ones. The Last Supper. But he started off, he didn't know. He had to learn. Right, now the same as Da Vinci, what happens? If you want to learn how to lead, you need to be yourself. You need to be authentic. Right? You need to believe in yourself, as I already explained to you. You might not be able to draw a horse. It might look like that rat of mine. But if you believe you can do it, you will be willing to learn and develop. And then you can learn to become a leader. We were never taught to, be, to lead. What happened? I mean, I um, ended up going through school and then I entered the world of work and I joined a corporate company and I was appointed as a trainee manager. I arrived. I'm going to be in charge. And they sent me to this academy for six weeks and they taught me all the theory. It was a retail organization, so I learned about merchandising, about cashing up, about banking, about merchandising. I even learned how to process supplier claims. But nobody ever taught me how to lead my people. And then I thought, wait, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go on a couple of courses. So I went on some courses. Some the company paid for, some I paid for myself. And I still didn't learn how to lead. Yeah, I learned how to fire people using the correct procedure. <laughs> but I never learned how to lead. Then I thought, no, wait. I'm going to do a degree. That's it. If I go to university, those people are clever. They're going to teach me how to lead. And I went to university and I got a BCom degree. But I still don't know how to lead. I was promoted to area manager though. Okay. And so it carried on. Studied and studied in Isabella. I got my DBA at 52, so there's still enough time for you for your PhD. Yes. Yes. 
But I studied and I learned and I learned. And I just didn't learn how to lead. And then eventually I started coming into contact with the John C. Maxwells, who also happens to be one of my favorite writers, and the Simon Sinek's and the Robert Greenleaf's and the rest of them. And I learned that there's a difference between managing and leading. All they teach us is how to manage. And what does a manager do? They control and they instruct. What does a leader do? They empower and they inspire. What does empowerment mean? It means to teach somebody to a level maybe even higher than yours. And what's the problem today when we were talking about the bosses that you don't like? They don't give you credit. They don't give you opportunity to learn. None of that. Because they are scared you're going to take their job. So you're not allowed to be creative. You get told how, what to think, not how to think. You're not allowed to shift your focus because the minute you try and jump out of the bowl, you get smacked back into the fishbowl. <laughs> it's not your place. It's not your job. Stick to your job description. <laughs> so how do we change it? Now I'm talking about leadership. And most of us, when we say leadership, we think, oh, you know, it's the president of Namibia. Yes, that's also leadership. But anybody that is responsible for the actions of somebody else is a leader. As a parent, you're a leader. If you are the secretary or you run a club, you're the leader. Just to give a bit of punt, uh, you all know now, Elry is the vice president of membership for Toastmasters. I'm the vice president of public relations, so I've got to give a bit of a marketing going in there. <laughs> But Brunt is the leader. He's the area director. So he's in charge of a number of clubs. So even in Toastmasters, you can learn how to lead. Because we go through the process. So the thing is, we need to practice most of the time. We learn by experience. If we take parenting, how do we learn? Trial and error. More error than trial. There's no manual or procedures manual that was written on parenting. Yes, there's a lot of books. But those are people that are telling you their experiences. But their child's not like my child. Yep. And I'm not like them. I have a different personality. So now I stumble through life and I carry on. And I try and learn. And it's the same with leadership. If you are prepared to think outside the box. If you are prepared to try and be more successful with your life and learn things. Then you can go about and you can attend courses. People now have leadership seminars, but unfortunately people still think leadership and management is the same thing. So half of these leadership seminars are actually just management training, teaching you how to smack your people and keep them in line. Like Brun says, toe the line, stay in the line, don't move outside the line. He's got a friend called Leonard the line. So That's important. We need to be allowed to grow. And you said, unfortunately, your boss has retired the one that you liked. So who was taught to take his place? Who was taught to take over from him and have the same skills and the same attributes? Being an authentic leader means that you are yourself. Authentic means I'm myself. If I like being nice to people, then I'm allowed to be nice to people. If I'm not nice to people, I need to learn how to be nice to people. But the point is, being authentic and being a leader, in the book Why Great Leaders, they have a leadership flag, which takes the word leadership and creates it into an acronym, and it gives you 10 attributes that a leader should have. Your lifestyle, example, uh, authority, emotional intelligence, self-discipline. There's a whole lot of, of them in there. You can go through that. It's, I'm going to be here too long if we do that. But there are different ways of learning how to lead. There are millions of books. So I've written another book or two. But these books are based again on my experience. Because there's no manual that says this is how you lead. These are from my experiences, what I've experienced and how I've learned and what I've learned, what leadership is and what I think. 
The book is slightly different. It's like an old school textbook. So it has summaries at the end of each chapter. It has a QR code so you can scan it. takes you to a private um, video summary of each chapter of about 15, 16 minutes. And like Isabella said, there's a journal that goes along with it. So if you want to learn and you want to be serious, then you journal it and you keep record of it. Those of you who know ISO, ISO auditor will say to you, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. And it's the same with your dreams. Isabella has managed to fulfill about 90% of her dreams and goals that she had. Why? Because she stayed aware of it. Write it down. There's something, some chemical reaction that happens in your brain that if you take the thought and you actually write it down, that there's a lot more chance of you achieving it than, than just talking about it or thinking about it. My mother used to work for Golden Products years ago and she had this thing, every time she wanted to buy a new car and she planned the car, she used to go get photos and stick it up in the bathroom everywhere. <laughs> so every time she looked at the fridge that she saw the car and it kept reminding her of her golf. Otherwise you forget. Mm. Alright, so once I've learned how to lead and I've learned the skill and I know what it takes to be a leader, then I need to get to the next part. Then I need to develop relationships. And this is where it comes in. The thing with relationships is, if we look at leadership, in 1997, Robert Greenleaf wrote a book called Servant Leadership, and then it sort of changed, and these days, the Maxwells, the Blanchards, the Sinex, the rest of them, the Van Dijk's, um, <laughs> All write about leadership and not management and about the, the way and, and the way you treat your people and being empathetic towards your people. Before that, we remember years ago how it used to be. But you know that two and a half thousand years ago, Sun Tzu, for those of you who read The Art of War, Chinese general, he started this whole thing about the leader shouldn't be the most important person. It's about protecting your country, protecting your emperor. The person that actually put it best, I don't know if they're cousins or brothers, but about 50 years later there was a Chinese philosopher called Lao Tzu, and he said, a leader is best when people barely know that he exists. And when the job is completed, they think they did it themselves. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And there's lots of guys that followed. Cicero, the Roman philosopher, Jesus in the Bible, all of them. If you want to lead, you first need to learn to serve. And then the wheels fell off. Our friend, Mr. Nicola Machiavelli came along. And he wrote a book called The Prince. And he said, it's all about the leader. You need to maintain control at whatever cost. Even if you are devious, you need to stay in control. It's the leader. And there's other guys that followed. Taylor, uh, Thomas Carlyle with the great man theory. Frederick Taylor said, never mind about the people. Just give them bonus. It's cool. <laughs> They'll work. Not a problem. And then we got the labor union started up. Although it started long before Carlyle, but the labor movement came along and then people suddenly started fighting. It was a them and us thing. Uh, you're not treating my people fairly, so now I've got somebody that fights on behalf of my people. And there was no leadership. And then as I said, fortunately, why is this thing not moving quick enough? Robert Greenleaf came along and he wrote a book called Servant Leadership. Leaders need to serve. And everybody went, what? <laughs> really? I'm in charge. I'm the boss. I have the corner office with a view. I drive the Beamer with a personalized number plate. How can you tell me I got to serve? <laughs> right. Carry on. And then as I said, we had the rest of them. The Blanchards and the Maxwells and Simon Sinek. I like Simon Sinek's yeah. book, um, Leaders Eat Last. He also he mentions an example there that um, Nelson Mandela used once, told about his father who was one of the headmen that used to say when he walks in and they have a, uh, a meeting that even though he was leading the meeting, he used to speak last. 
He says, because two things happen when you speak last. He says that the people that you're allowed to talk first get the feeling that they are heard and that they are listened to. See, but the most important thing is where you had one solution, you and there are 20 people in the room, you now suddenly have 20 solutions. Yeah. Because you decided to keep quiet and to listen, to step back and let somebody else take the shine. So if we look at relationships... Hiring and firing. Since when did the bottom line become more important than the people? Yeah. What do we do? So I'll fire you. Don't need you. Gone out of here because I need to save costs. What's happened in Swakop with the mines? Uh, sales are down. Uh, business is bad. Economy's crashed. Okay, so what do we do? Those 100 people, they don't work here anymore. Thanks, there you go. I'm in the training game. I've been a trainer for 19, 20 years that I've had my own company. And the thing that I find the most when you get to a company, the minute times are tough, what does the company do? They cut the training budget. No, sorry, we don't have money for training. That's actually the time when you should be training, teaching the people new skills. So they can multi-skill them. I can move you into something else. I don't have to fire you. I can give you another job to do. Brunt says nearly half of the jobs in 20 years' time are going to be non-existent. So we need to teach our people other jobs so that they can carry on working. No. Shareholders. They're the main people. We've got to protect the shareholders. Protect the bottom line. It's all about the money. Communication, one of you said. Leaders don't communicate anymore. When last have you, if you are a leader, or when last has your boss got up off his butt in his office and walked over to you and started a conversation with you? Send a WhatsApp. You're on WhatsApp group. We have a meeting. <laughs> Driving at 160 on the highway. Ping, ping. <laughs> yeah, technology is a great thing. But technology now runs our life. I mean, I nearly blew my gasket. My son broke up with his first girlfriend by sending her an SMS. It's the norm for the kids. We have WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups and Instagram and what's the other gram and all these other things. I'm nearly 60. I'm still trying to catch up with the technology. It doesn't work for me. But the point is we don't communicate. We are finding now with being involved in professional speaking or public speaking. So just to explain the difference quickly, Toastmasters will teach you how to speak. The Professional Speakers Association of Southern Africa and Namibia will teach you how to make money when you learn how to speak. Okay. That's the difference between the two. <laughs> but we've got this whole professional speaking, public speaking. If you look on YouTube and you look on the internet and that, it looks like these guys, there's millions of these people. You've got TEDx, you've got Toastmasters, you've got World Championships and all kinds of things. Because people are realizing that we need to look at one another. If you're sending a WhatsApp, oops, I accidentally had cap locks on. Now what does the other person think? Oh, he's shouting at me. No, sorry, I made a mistake. I SMSed my son once. My son was in a, in a boarding school in Cape Town. Uh, I used to stay in Durmville about 50 kilometers away, so it wasn't really a border. They were called weekly borders because they didn't stay the weekends. Friday afternoon, I had to go fetch my son. But now I was running a little bit late, so I sent him an SMS. Oh, what's it? It's called a, a, a text message. <laughs> so I texted him, and I asked him, where are you? I'm running late. Where are you? When must I pick you up? He sends back, at the hotel. This is a grade 10 kid. What the hell are you doing at the hotel on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> Bugger this phone. Hey, where are you? What, where are you? No, I'm at the hostel. Oh, okay, Mr. S. <laughs> That's what happens. You know what's the beauty of face-to-face -face communication? You can see the person's facial expressions. You can see their body language. Hey? Oh, you put your hand up. I thought you wanted to say something. Stay on their phone 
It's worth at home. I. My wife. Uh, my wife has this thing that I'm always on my phone. But I'm not always on my phone. I mean, I've been in Ochivarongo for a week training. I haven't been at the office for all week. Actually, today Matthew's here, so there's nobody at the office today. But now, the, my only means of communication, I mean, I've also fallen in the trap. Emails, WhatsApp, so you're now trying to catch up. I went on to Facebook last night for the first time. And a very good friend of mine had a birthday on Monday already, but I only saw it yesterday. Because I don't get there. There's too much to do. Anything. But my wife was very against this Facebook thing. And then she, her sister convinced her to get into Facebook. Now when she wakes up at 4 o'clock in the morning and she can't sleep, dance at Facebook. But i got no problem if you're looking at Facebook on your phone. But why do you have to play the video clip at full blast when I'm sleeping? And that's what happens. But it's serious. I mean, my kids, uh, before WhatsApp, it was, um, what's that stuff? Mix it. Uh -huh. Then I'm driving because my daughter's in a girl's school in Paul and my son was in Paul Boys Eye, in, in, one in La Rochelle and one in Boys Eye. So they're both in Paul and they're two blocks apart. Now it's a 50 kilometer drive. So on a Sunday when I'm taking them back, then they're dead quiet in the back and they're sitting on their phones. I say, what you guys doing? Now we're chatting to one another. But you're sitting next to one another. <laughs> no, but they're sitting on... It's cheaper on mix it. Excuse me. <laughs> so we don't talk. So how are you going to develop relationships with your staff if you don't talk to them? So if you have a boss that doesn't communicate with you, get up and you go to his office and you go start a conversation. You're probably scammed to death, but anyway. <laughs> Do it. You know, it's another thing. We go through the schooling system. Brunt was saying. You get born. That's the first time you get punished. You get your butt whacked. Ah! Okay. Now you go through that whole process. We get groomed and we get told what to do. But what's another thing that we get taught? All through life. Can't make a mistake. No. Do it right. Not allowed to make mistakes. How do you learn if you don't make mistakes? She now give my age away. I have a granddaughter. She's, <laughs> she's in January, she'll be two. But last December, um, we were all in Cape Town because I have a house in, in up the West Coast as well in South Africa. And we were all there with a the family and everything. And my son then came down. He stays in Vintuk. They came down so that the family down there could see the little one. But she, was, she turned a year in January. So over Christmas... It was. Yeah. Okay, so then she stands and she goes, okay, she's going to go, she's going to go, she's going to go, boom, she falls down. And, goes, ah! and, uh, and then she tries again. <laughs> what if we done? Oh, she fell down. Oh, that's it. She's useless. Come and get another baby. Follow this one anymore. This one doesn't understand. We don't allow for failure. Yeah. Now, like each one of us, we've learned a couple of sayings. Brunt says, don't move on, move up. I tell people, failure is only failure if you don't learn a lesson from it. Yes. If you learn from failure, it's experience. Yeah. That's how we learn. But now what happens? We're too scared to make mistakes. Why? Because the boss doesn't communicate with us. The only time he communicates is via WhatsApp or when we get a written warning. Mm -hmm. So we're too scared to make a mistake. So we sit there and... and Ooh, yeah. What happens? We don't develop as leaders ourselves because we don't want to make decisions anymore. What if it's the wrong decision and I make a mistake? Oh, hell, yeah, what now? Brant has a friend that he told me about once. She made an accounting error in the books and they were being audited and she'd made a $40,000 error. Now she's sitting and she's nervous and she goes to Brant and she says, What am I going to do? I'm going to get into trouble. I'm going to get fired. He says, go talk to your boss. No, I can't talk to my boss. Just now they get cross or they fire me. He says, well, if you don't talk to them, they find out they're still going to fire you. So take the chance and go talk to them. And she went up and she spoke to the boss. And the boss said, okay, cool, great. Luckily, we got the mistake before the auditors got here so we could fix it. 
But if she'd sat on it and waited till the auditors, then she would have been in trouble. But it's because leaders don't allow people to make mistakes. They don't allow them to learn by experience. So people get too scared. And it comes from the communication. Sorry, I'm quoting Brunt again. But I use it in my training as well. When people say, yeah, but and this, I need to go ask, especially when they want to take decisions, I'm not quite sure. If you're going to come to me and you're going to ask me something, or ask advice. Don't come with a problem. Come with a solution. Yep. Instead of saying, I don't know how to do this, how should I do this? Say, you know what, I have this problem, but I was thinking, couldn't we do this? And if it's the wrong thing, I'd say to you, no, nah, maybe not. Maybe we should go this route. Or, oh yeah, that's a great idea. How else are you going to learn? Right, so we need to allow for mistakes. If we look at a family, for instance, I think I'm jumping a couple of slides, but if you take a family, I take it you either all have children, some of you might be nearly as old as me and have grandchildren, but you have children, we have a family, so you're a leader. Now what happens? You've got your son playing cricket with his buddies outside. Ah, he smacks the ball through the lounge window. Uh, excuse me, son. Here's a notice of a disciplinary hearing. What you did was against family rule number 67. <laughs> damaging family property. Uh, you can bring your two-year-old sister along as your representative. It's cool. <laughs> and then the next day you sit with your son and say, okay, now... I realize you haven't been in this family very long, you're know, only four years old, but um, we have rules in this family, and unfortunately, you've now broken that rule, and you've cost the family a lot of money in the mistakes that you made in that. Uh, I think you need to leave the family and go find another family. Do we do that? No. So why do we do it to our staff? Good point. Huh? Why is our first reaction, or your... Leader's first reaction when something goes wrong, hey, disciplinary. It shouldn't be that way. If we want to build relationships, we've got to have empathy. We've got to allow people to make mistakes. We've got to allow people to learn. Right. Relationships. I call it the three R's of relationship. For those of you to remember, I need to explain it properly because I think the Minister of Basic Education in South Africa got a roasting because she just said the three R's of communication and the two people that responded had no idea what she was actually talking about, so they put both feet in their mouth before they realized it. But when we were younger, we used to talk about the three R's of education. Arithmetic, writing, W-R, although it was R because it's R, and reading. So... In relations or relationships, we have three R's. We have the relationship, rules, and then results or respect or return, depending on whether you're looking at financially or whatever. The relationship needs to be formed before you make the rules. You get married, you and your wife go along. You don't, when you get married, say, okay, you know what, the children have to be in by 10 o'clock. And no, you enjoying your marriage. Then when the child gets born, can you, can you, yeah, yeah. and then you love the child to death. And after about two years, when the child can start thinking and listening, and then you say, okay, you know what, because I love you, I want you to please stick to these rules. Try and stick, because if you don't, then everything will work fine. You don't first make the rules in the hope that you're one day going to have a child. <laughs> because if you do it that way the relationship is there the trust is there then if you give me the rules I'm going to follow them because I understand why they are there so then I will respect you then there will be results because I will do what's expected of me then if you look at it from a financial perspective there will be a return but if you do it the other way around and you put the rules first the last R turns to rebellion because if I have those rules and I'm a disciplinarian, what's going to happen? The first time the child is allowed out, that's it. Then and he does everything he's not supposed to do. 
Why? Because you held them there. And it's the same in an organization. If you don't allow your people to think for themselves, you don't allow them to be creative, you don't allow them to grow and be free and not feel scared of you and try and hide all their mistakes, and you allow them to fail every now and then and learn from it, then you will develop the relationship. And then they will follow the rules. I used to, as I said, I was promoted to an area manager in this retail organization. But this was like about 20 years ago. If I knew then what I know now, I'd have had a totally different team. Each branch, if they made their sales target for the month, the branch manager and the staff would get a production bonus. I would only get a production bonus if my whole area made target. Now, obviously, that means just about every shop has to make target, and the one or two don't, and the other have to make way over target so that my area makes target, because it's the total of the branch's target becomes my target. So my whole focus was on, come on, guys, more promotions, and you need to do this, and you must advertise, and you must get them, you must work overtime, and you must do all of it, because I want my bonus. I mean, I could do a lot with that money. But if I'd gone the other way around, if I knew then what I know now, and instead I had tried to develop the manager and try and make the branch manager be the best manager that he could and lead his staff properly, what would happen? He'd work, he'd deliver, he'd automatically make bon target. And what would happen? I'd make my bonus without even focusing on the bonus. So it mustn't be about the bottom line, it must be about the people. So the next letter is the T that comes to trust and it would have been nice if I had a flip chart then I could have drawn you nice funny little pictures but it's alright I'll try and explain it to you no I just wanted to mention the way you're talking about um, this, you know, leaders should allow their people to make mistakes um, recently I think about two weeks back we were at the same event at Haya Lodge and then we were in the restaurant and then it so happened that the lady who was helping us uh, a plate fell, but then lucky enough, after it fell, she went maybe to get another one. And then I would hear in the kitchen, probably the manager or whatever, Neil kind of kind of pay up the duck, so for a whole lot So I heard her first, so I quickly ran to the lady. I said, I'm the one who broke that thing, not you. So I quick when she came, yeah, I'm gonna say, 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 i why would you do that? Why didn't a true leader who allowed the people to fail, who had empathy, would have gone and said, I see you broke the plate. Um, is there something wrong? Do, you know, or are, are you feeling okay? Do you maybe need somebody to help you carry? Did you have too many plates? No. Oh, take it off your pay. But we do that. I had a similar incident at the hotel I was staying in Tochiverongu, where I was sitting in the restaurant, and the restaurant is full. Luckily, they all German and French visitors. I don't think they understood the Afrikaans. But you could definitely hear by the tone of voice that he was shouting at the chef. I'm saying, yeah, there's yeah. a responsibility. And I'm sitting there, and then he comes past, he says to me, now I'm here. I was about to say to him, I need to talk to you. So I thought, no, wait, because if I now I start, I can't know a scene mark. So let me just leave it at that. But that's what happens. And in most cases, because we are under pressure, our first reaction is, instead of just stepping back, relax, think a little bit about it. So firstly, you need to learn how to lead. Once you have the skills of leading, attending seminars, reading books, going on courses, doing degrees, whatever it is that teaches you the skill of leading people. Then, what happens is you will develop relationships because you'll know how. And once you've developed the relationships, then your team will start trusting you. So, with trust, what you need to realize, and that's where this whole servant leadership and relational leadership comes in, Sorry, Mr. Machiavelli, it's not about you, the leader. It's not always about you. 
there's a one of the symphony big symphony orchestra um, conductors in the states uses his orchestra and his his job when he also does leadership talks and i use it in leadership as well if you look at your team if you're the leader when you are working when you're the secretary or when you're the cleaner or whether you are the driver or whatever it is that you are in the organization your success in your job is dependent on your performance correct but when you're the leader your success is dependent on what your team's performance so it's not about you if you go back to Lao Tzu if you can get to a position where you're the leader and your team achieves the objectives and they don't even realize that you were there leading them then you've arrived yeah. so it's not about you realize that yes There's this quote that I like, and it's, it similarly goes like this, that in the end, parents learn more from their children than what the children learn from their parents. <laughs> so you could see it, okay, I'm not in the corporate world in any way, but I'm just a student, but I just want to know that if you see the child as the worker and the parent is the manager, how do these children teach the manager to become a better leader? Easy. It's very easy. The parent allows the child to think, to have their own thoughts, to be creative, to come up with ideas. You don't know everything as the parent. You're basing your experience as a parent, even sometimes as a leader or manager, on a book you read. And the problem with most of these leadership books, yeah, I need to be a thought leader. So that means I need to be an expert in a field. So I've now coined relational leadership. But you have transactional leadership and you have creative leadership and you it's still leadership. Everybody is saying the same thing. Now what happens is we read all these books as leaders and now it's this craze and then all of a sudden this guy comes out with this and then and in the end we get so confused we don't really know what it is because we're trying to as Isabella said, trying to wear somebody else's shoes. Authentic leadership. Be yourself. We all have different personalities. In the same way, we all have different leadership styles. So if you allow your people, if you allow them to make mistakes and you're going to have the relationship with them, what's going to happen? Is they are going to be prepared to make suggestions. So if I make a wrong suggestion, oops, okay, you're going to help me. That's not a problem. You're not going to fire me. So now are we prepared to make a suggestion? Might be a wacky suggestion. But at least I'm starting to think. And I'm starting to offer. And I'm starting to give input. And in that way, the parent learns from the child. Alright. What I'm trying to say is like, let's say the boss isn't the most ready for the acceptable person. And let's say... Okay, in an example is, if she wants my cooperation, my mom here, if she wants my cooperation at home, she has to, I want her to talk to you in a very respectful way. And the same is in a workplace. So how do you teach your boss how to treat you the way you right. want? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like, how do you get your boss to be respectful on, on, your, on your own leadership level? I'll give you a business card and you send them on one of my courses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's obviously a lot more difficult from the bottom up. Because if they're not listening to you, they don't value your opinion. Yeah. You're just a number. So chances are you're not going to get in there. I would suggest trying to sort of form a relationship. I had a situation where I was an internal auditor of an organization. And every Monday morning I had a meeting with the financial director. And then I had to report back on the week what happened and this and that and everything. And then I would get to him and say to him, you know what, we have a problem at this branch. So and so and so. Ah, but it's not supposed to be like that. Ah, you, you are not there. So what must I do? I don't care, just fix it. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? Okay. Now, you obviously realize that I get the back so I um, 
I, I will take a chance, and I'm bigger. Those days I was like 20 kilos heavier, so I, I was prepared to, to take a couple of people on. So what I would do is I'd come to him, and then I'd, yeah, this is the problem, that's a problem. Then I'd say to him, you know what? Don't you think we should maybe do this or do that? Yeah, that's a good idea. And then I would afterwards send him an email and say to him, it was a great meeting this morning. And so you say that this idea of yours that we must do this, that's the right idea. Yeah, 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 do that. <laughs> now he thinks it's his idea, but it was my idea. But I'm prepared to give him the credit because now what happened is eventually then he, would, he realized what was going on. So then come to me, listen, we have this and this, what do you think we should do? All right, but it takes time. A relationship works from both sides. It takes time. But if we look at the next concept, I developed a concept called leader rings. Now, if I had a, I'd draw you a nice squiggly picture, very creative squiggly picture if I had a flip chart. But basically, if we look at this picture, this explains the concept of leader rings. I don't know if any of you, you know if you take a stone or a rock and you throw it into a pool of water or into a dam or something, what happens? Splash and it goes, those ripples. You notice which way the ripples go? They go from the outside in, hey? Do they go from the outside in? No, no they go from the inside out. Okay. So, same concept. In the middle is the leader. And the leader has these rings around them. And it works outwards, and it works outwards, and it works outwards. So, the, where does the rock land? In the middle. So, who's supposed to take the brunt of the hit? The leader. The leader. So, the leader takes the force of the blow and protects the team. But each leader has another ring that follows. And if you look at the pictures, you notice which way they're facing. Outward. So if we, we spoke about Cicero, the Roman emperor, if you remember the old Roman army and the armies from those days, when they used to go to war, they had that bronze and leather breastplate that they used to put on. Okay. They had this helmet that covered their face. And they had these things on their arms. And some of them had these, um, it's like a flexible metal chain type thing called nail gloves and that. And they had these things over their legs and they had boots on and everything and they had a shield and they had a sword or a spear and they were ready for the army but have you ever noticed at the back it's nothing so the Roman army had this technique where they used to form a square facing outwards have you ever looked at or noticed what buffalo do when the, the, the little one is being attacked by a lion they form a circle with their backs to one another and their horns outwards Wow. Same concept. So in other words, the job of the leader is not to protect yourself or the shareholder. The job of the leader is to have the back of the person below you. So you're facing outwards. You're taking those arrows and nobody can, and that person knows, I don't have to keep turning around to see what's going on. I can face forward and I can do what I have to do because I know I can trust the person behind me. In other words, I can trust the person above me to have my back and to look out for me. In leadership, what happens? Listen, we need to uh, come up with a plan to do some more sales. Yeah, it says, Elry, why don't we um, paint the outside of the building green and put purple spots on it and then people will notice the building and they'll come to the building. Yes, now that's a brilliant idea. So you do it and you paint it. And then the MD comes along and says, what the hell's going on here? I don't know, it was Elry. She... Uh, <laughs> Those are the leaders we have. They don't stick up for us. Yeah. Corporate salute. It wasn't me, it was them. But, had the boss now come and said, yeah, this is a cool idea. I think this will work. Yeah, no, I mean, this will you know what? Now all of a sudden, Elry's forgotten. That's not using leader rings. You're not developing trust. I had somebody that was like that. A, a boss that was like that. Eventually what you do, is you sit in the meeting, any ideas? Oh, God, I'm not saying anything. No. Mm -hmm. Are you, no, no. But you always have it. No, no, I've run out of ideas now. Why am I going to give you ideas and you're going to take the credit? So, there's no trust. And that's the thing with leader rings. That person needs to know 
But no matter. And it goes all the way to the outside. That person working down at the lowest level, they're going to put in 110% for the company or for the team. Why? Because they know behind me I've got somebody protecting me. Take a traffic cop. Have you ever thought of this? You get the traffic cop. There's this, if it's in Australia and you have those road trains, they carry like about 400 tons. And you've got this 400 ton truck hurtling down at you at 80 kilometers an hour. Actually, he's doing 85, so he's over the speed limit. So what do you do? Stop! And what does the truck do? He slams on anchors. That traffic cop. There's no way in hell he's going to stop that truck if that truck didn't hit the anchors. Yep. But you know what? He knows that he's wearing a uniform. He knows that he's part of an organization. That if that truck driver knocks him down, he's going to have the whole municipality, the whole council, the whole government, everybody on his neck. That traffic cop trusts that he's doing whatever he's doing, he's being backed. That's why he steps out in front of the truck. I wouldn't step out even if I had two uniforms on. But that traffic cop has that trust. And that's what you want. The people will do things because they trust you. 100%. If we look at these leader rings, it creates safety. I've got the person that's got my back. They're looking after me. So I feel safe in the organization. Because I know I'm protected from behind. I'm not suddenly going to get a surprise and get called into the office and get handed a written warning or something. They'll have my back. They'll look out for me. If something goes wrong and I make a mistake, they'll say, no, this was it. And I was there. I saw what happened. And they'll stick up for you. They won't drop you. Right. Feedback. Get to the communication. Feedback we have. You need to keep telling people. People want to know how they did. If I did something, I mean, did I do a good job or did I do a bad job? It's fine, you've got my back and everything, but am I actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I don't want to wait a whole year and then, oh, I got, didn't get a bonus, so, oh, shit. <laughs> Was my work not good enough or what happened? Or maybe you are lucky and you work for an organization that does performance proposals. We've heard of the open door policy. How about an open ear policy? Not just say, oh, we have an open door policy, and then when you get to the boss's office, the door's locked. Because he's having a meeting, or he's out playing golf. But somebody that actually, if you come to them and say, uh, listen, I stuffed up, I made a mistake. Okay, sit down, let's talk about it. See how we can fix it. I tried something, Matthew's here. I tried something with my staff. I've done a performance appraisal on them, and then I asked them, to write a letter or send me an email or whatever, and they need to tell me five things that they thought I did well as a leader, and five things that I thought that they thought I didn't do well as a leader that wasn't working. And I got it. And I know they were a bit scruffy in the beginning. I said to them, listen, you're not going to get into trouble. Go for it. Just be honest with me. I, I want to know. I want to know what you think of me. And then they got it and I read it and then we sat down one on one in the boardroom and said, okay, so explain this. this yeah, I understand that. Explain this to me. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm guilty of this. So what can we do to change it? And I'm sure if Matthew had to do it now again today, there'd probably still be some of those on the list because I probably still haven't fixed them all. You don't just suddenly tell somebody, oh, it mustn't be done like this. And now, well, magic, some salabim. Now they do it. It doesn't work that way. It's a repetitive thing. You've got to keep practicing it. So, the same way I expect them to change and to deliver, they need to know that they can trust me. They need to know that I will, I will also listen to them and I'm also prepared to change if I have to. But if the leader is not prepared to do that and they're not prepared to listen, then it's going to be damn difficult. And maybe... This Art of Leadership is a new book, but maybe the book after that I'll they'll figure out how to get the, you to be able to go get the manager to change. I know somebody wrote a book once about fire your boss, but that was more about starting your own business. So, um, but maybe that might be a good idea. I wonder what it would be like. Actually, I was watching the rugby the other day and I was thinking, 
How come a player can get a red card and get sent off the field by the referee? Why can't they give the referee a red card if he blows or makes a mistake? Nothing happens to him. Next game, he's blowing again. I know there was a, in, in um, Varsity Cup rugby in South Africa, the, the player, the captain has a white card and he's allowed to use it once. So if he doesn't like a decision that the referee made, he can use the white card and then they go and they go check the TV ref. I mean, and the, and then the, so it's a start. <clears throat> if you want to be a leader, you need to learn to serve first. You need to learn to protect your people. Have you ever noticed what happens if you have a boss, not a leader, you have a boss that's a manager? And he's always shouting the odds. And you've always got to bend down and bow down and, yes, your worship. <laughs> Have you noticed which part of the employee then faces the customer? The back side. So why not change it? Why not build relationships? Why not develop trust? And if you develop trust and you have the back of your employee or your team member, who are they facing? They're now facing the customer. Richard Branson was the guy that said, forget about training customer service and the rest of it. He says, look after your employees and they will automatically do the customer service. Because they will want to do what you want them to do. Because you have a relationship with them. Because they trust you. So I need you to do one thing for me. If you're a leader, what type of leader are you? Are you that big, powerful black stallion? Or are you a rat? Thank you.